Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Financial Advisors Workshop. This is the show where we interview folks that are professional financial advisors in our industry. I'm a professional financial advisor, and I will always be. And uh, we interview some of the best and brightest in our industry so we can all learn from each other and uh, display uh, the great uh, the great works that our folks are doing for the investing public all around America. And uh, today we have Nate Allman with us, and Nate is the leader of Cornerstone Wealth Management. And, uh, and Nate, welcome to the uh, Financial Advisor Workshop. Thank you, Brian. Very happy to be here. Excellent. Now, Nate, you're... Um, you're, you're a financial planner as well, certified financial planner, and you're out of North Carolina. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into the business, and then tell us how you got to the point where you're now running Cornerstone. Sure. Um, so cool. let me start with the organization first, because it's been around longer than me. Um, he is my father-in-law, for full disclosure. Uh, nice. I was uh, serving in the Air Force. I was a B-52 bomber pilot and really, um, it's a very long story, but felt uh, called out of that career. And when I got uh, through all the career change books I could find, uh, what I needed to uh, go into was a small team environment. I needed to help people and I enjoyed finance. So my, my backup plan, if I couldn't find something better, I was going to go work with my father-in-law. That became my primary plan. Um, and I joined Cornerstone in 2007. Um, so I had, you know, 12-ish months of watching Floyd interact with clients in a good market. And then things started to fall apart. And I watched how he got to do it in the, the global financial crisis. Um, and okay. how he was really able to generate... Uh, peace of mind for clients going through financial planning to see what they were on track for, um, putting together simple but elegant investment portfolios that uh, could help them reach their goals through that time. So nice. um, in about 2013, uh, I and two other people bought in to Cornerstone. Um, so I became a partner at that point. A couple of years after that, Floyd kind of handed over the reins uh to me um we weren't great the military is really good at change of command ceremonies uh floyd and cornerstone team not so great at it so uh it was a little bit um yeah we we tripped and stumbled a little bit in the, the handoff of leadership but um a few years after we started doing uh the entrepreneurial operating system uh floyd actually stepped off of our leadership team uh, and that allowed me and the other uh, people on the leadership team to really step into that leadership role to create our own vision and and start carrying the company uh, into the the next generation. Nice, nice. So, so you didn't spend a bunch of time at a warehouse bank or anything like that. You jumped right in uh, through through your your relative, and that's really a neat way to come in. Um, so, well, good. Now, you mentioned something about the entrepreneurial operating system, and uh, I came to realize that I, I understand that and I understand where it came from. Tell our listeners a little bit more about that, because that sounds like a really interesting way to run a company. It has really transformed uh, us and how we do things. So I was actually a part of a strategic coach is that uh, Dan Sullivan strategic coach I did that for a couple of years and would come up with these great ideas at the coaching coaching session and come back to the team and they would just fall flat and I was getting more and more frustrated with that and uh, got given the book traction by Gina Wickman which explains the entrepreneurial operating system and it was really everything that uh, hadn't been working with strategic coach it fixed those things. So it gave us a system to have meetings, to bring issues up, uh, how to solve those issues. It helped us get really clear on our core values, uh, on our mission, who we are, who we help, and how we help them. Um, really helped us clean up a lot of our systems and processes uh, so that we can minimize the amount of errors and the amount of 
you know, reinventing the wheel that we have to do. Mm -hmm. So, so was it now run that way before then you're saying? We, we, we did our best. Uh, we just didn't have the framework uh, to really retain a lot of that uh, institutionalized learning. Um, so now we've got the vision traction organizer uh, for anybody that's watching it on. Um, so we update that document every quarter. Uh, we've got listed out our core values, our core focus, what we're passionate about, um, what our target client looks like and how we help them, what makes us unique. And then it's broken down into a three-year picture, a one-year plan, uh, and quarterly rocks uh, is what they call them. The rocks, that's right. Um, now you've done, you've done obviously work in the military. You mentioned that a little bit earlier. And uh, it sounds like, you know, there's a very regimented program in the military. Does that help too? Do you think there's some overlap between the EOS system and military protocol? Oh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe that was the, my first career probably made me crave uh, that structure a little bit. Um, I do love a checklist uh, with my pilot background and uh, it's really given us that. So we've got a, our weekly meetings all have uh, a set agenda that we follow um, pretty religiously. Um, we, we feel the freedom to modify it. We've been doing it for, I guess, about seven years now. Um, so we don't stick to it when we don't need to. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. But it's similar, yeah. So you talked about um, when we were discussing earlier about uh, within that system, there's an accountability chart, and and uh, in running a firm, you have I think you said you have 12 employees now. Is that right? Correct. Yep. So, how do all those employees get heard? And tell us a little bit more about this accountability chart, and maybe that helps it. Yeah. Yeah. the The EOS system uh, helped us figure out again. That's a uh, traditionally we would have called it an organizational chart. They call it an accountability chart. So you put the role together uh, with listed underneath it is all the things that that role is held accountable to. Mm -hmm. So that and our core values is really helping us uh, hold all of our team members to a high standard. So everybody knows what uh, everybody's supposed to be doing. Uh, and then we have a mechanism to make sure that they they actually are. Excellent. So does that help um, every member of the team get heard? Like how, how would that, how would that work? Correct. Yeah. Um, so another part of EOS is a scorecard. Um, I think the, the term in the book is everyone has a number. So we've modified that quite a bit, but what that has turned into is uh, a weekly scorecard that all of our team members fill out. Um, so if they have an issue, problem, opportunity, um, just something that they're thinking about, they put that on their weekly scorecard and that gets uh, discussed by the leadership team, uh, usually that week. Um, if we have a particularly busy week, it might take a couple of weeks to get through, but um, that gives everybody the mechanism to help make us better. Mm -hmm. So you've been growing nicely as a firm and um, Four Star, our firm is similar that we're growing uh, rapidly. And uh, there's an element of chaos to growth. And uh, do, you, do you think that this really helps manage that chaos better? Is that part of the idea? Uh, yeah, we have found that it helps manage the chaos uh, a lot. Uh, there, you're never going to get rid of it completely. Um, so one of the, we didn't talk about this, but one of the unique things that we put on our scorecard is a quality of life measure. So we actually ask our clients their quality of life. That's one of the thing that we're passionate about is improving the quality of people's lives. So we ask our clients that also. But what we found uh, a few years into EOS was that we weren't asking that of each other. So now every week when they fill out the scorecard, every uh, team member is putting an internal inside the office, how's your quality of life, and external, you know, home life, how's your quality of life. And that's right. helped us to figure out when somebody's starting to get overwhelmed. If the chaos is getting a little too much on the client service team, uh, then maybe we pull a paraplanner over to 
to help them catch up. Nice. It really does sound like a, a great way to manage, uh, manage a firm. It's quite good. Um, uh, as we've been using it for again, like seven years, I've met a lot of businesses that are on it or starting it. Um, not just in the financial services uh, industry, but there are a bunch of those too. I, I think it, it resonates with a lot of people. Great. So like you have it uh, organized quite well and managing it. So um, good. Let's, let's switch gears a little bit if we could, Nate, and talk about um, working with clients. So now you have families and everyone works with different families and there's a service team as well. Um, what is your main goal in working with financial advisory clients? What are you trying to accomplish with that? Uh, we think there's too much worry and distraction in the world, especially around money stuff. So what we want to do is help improve the quality of people's lives. Um, the, the rest of the phrase that we've written out is by helping them put money in its right place. But really that's by helping them understand what they're on track for and reduce that worry so they can go do the things that they're great at that they love to do and they don't have to be worried about you know did that transaction go through or how are my how's my 401k doing how are my investments doing mm -hmm. they can lean on us uh for all of that and again just do the things that they love to do that they're great at great which would be hang with the grandchildren other things Hang with the grandchildren. A lot of our clients are into um, nonprofit organizations. They love donating their time and energy uh, to other ministries. Um, yeah, some travel, enjoying life. Uh, life is about uh, so much more than money. Uh, the money should help us enjoy life. Uh, and I think too many people in, in our culture get that backwards. Yes. So, um, so this is what you attempt to do, and how how does that go? Um, are you able to keep most people from like panicking in bad markets because they know you have a plan, or or just keep the level head, or you still have some people kind of go off go off kilter a little bit? Yeah, the the people I worry about are the clients that have come in since the last downturn. Uh, so they haven't been through a downturn with us. They don't know quite what to expect yet. But um, you know, our investment process for most of our clients, we have a blend of what we call active and passive investments. And those tend to behave differently in bad markets or good markets. So uh, by blending those two together, we found that we can help alleviate some clients worry Um so generally, the active investments tend to do better in choppy and down markets. So if we're in the middle of a bad year like last year, the active is probably going to be better. And when we're coming in for a progress review with clients, we can show them that. Okay, this one's down right now. It was up more last year, um, but it's it's struggling now. But you're okay either way. And then we lean back on the, the financial planning to support that. Right. You were on track last year for $120,000 a year. This year in the, you know, I guess 22 was a horrible year. Maybe you're down to 115. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember a, a lot of clients through the downturns that we've met with are surprised at how little a 30%, 25% decrease in the market has on their long-term financial plan. Yeah, it, uh, keeping it in perspective is important. And uh, that's what you're attempting to do. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And you think that you achieved, you achieved that pretty well? You don't have any any panic calls last week or anything like that? No. Um, we I tell the story all the time with new clients usually. Uh, I remember a call in 2000, late 2008, early 2009. Um, so I was pretty new in the business. And uh, this woman called and she said, I know what you're going to say, but I need to hear it again. And I just loved that. Um, she just needed the reassurance that we were here and we were on top of it. Uh, and uh, we get those occasionally. Uh, this is a similar kind of call. I know what you're going to say, but can you just tell me again? Of course. Absolutely. So when they're repeating back to you what you told them the last time we had a downturn, then you know you've got them. 
Isn't that rewarding? Like we, we've helped them put the worry in the right place. That's uh, awesome. It, it doesn't need to be hanging over your head. We have a really logical, uh, consistent solution uh, based off of your goals that we're helping you get to. Nice. Very nice. Well, good. You're getting, and, getting me passionate. I'm <laughs> yes, you are passionate about it, and that's evident. And and then we also talked a little bit about the number of advisors you have, and then how how you keep everyone working together on similar type work, and keep uh, recommendations similar. Let's talk a little bit about that. That's something as we you know, transition from the first generation of Cornerstone to now the second. Um, we, we've talked about it a lot and uh, it, I just decided this is the way that I, I, I need it to work. I need us to be uh, operating together, the, whether the clients are meeting with me or one of the other four advisors, they're going to end up with the same solution. And one of the big reasons for that is I, I'm not the smartest guy. I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. So I want to make sure that our other really smart advisors are having time and space to do clear thinking and engage their thoughts to make sure that we're all coming to the best solution possible for, for our clients. Um, so we meet weekly as an advisor team uh, to bang out ideas and bring up issues there. Um, and then we also have quarterly planning meetings uh, where we do a deep dive into what clients are saying, uh, that's like a recurring, I uh, think number three on the agenda for those quarterly meetings, uh, is to talk through what, what are the questions we're hearing from our clients and make sure that we're, uh, staying in, in tune with one another. Um, that's also translated into, uh, we make sure that another advisor has double checked any, uh, recommendation for a client before that gets presented to the client. Nice. Nice. Well, good. Uh, it it uh, it seems like you, that that does give some coordination, and that way, um, if someone isn't around and a client calls in, you know what they've heard, you understand what they've heard, and then then you have some certainty in how you can help them. It, it helps the whole enterprise go that way. Yeah, um, and so this kind of tying a few of those pieces together, um, mm -hmm. we we want one of our core values is work life harmony. So when our advisors are on vacation, I want them on vacation. If one of their clients is panicking about the market, one of the other advisors knows enough of what's going on with that client to be able to calm them down uh, and tell them the same thing uh, so that that client can go enjoy their vacation, hopefully. Yes, we all need a break. Well, good. So um, Nate, how do you develop client relationships then? Now that we know the operating system and your objectives, how do you find clients? How we find clients? Um, I wish I had a magic button to generate new ones when we were ready. Mm -hmm. um, so most of our team had a prior career uh, before they got into the financial services. So I was a pilot. We have another guy on the team who was a pilot. We've got a couple of former golf professionals. Um, so it would, a lot of those relationships, uh, have helped us get introduced to other people. Um, so the, the golf guys love going to the golf course and meeting new people that way. Uh, we also do roughly quarterly client appreciation events. Uh, and sometimes we'll have, uh, give clients the opportunity to invite a friend to that, um, but really meeting new people has been go out and do life. Um, you know, enjoy the the parts of life that we uh, we love and we're passionate about, uh, and meeting people that way. Nice. And how have you found your largest client? We found our largest client. So, um, they they were here when I got here. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so we we've got a cool story. Um one of the clients who had the most money with us for quite a while um, act initially came to us for debt counseling. Um, okay. So this is my father-in-law's story. He met with this couple, put some, uh, you know, debt recovery plan in place, uh, got a phone call from the guy. 
uh, I think a few months later and said, I'm, I need your help again. And I remember him uh, telling the story. He said, I, I just knew he'd fallen back into debt uh, when he finally got a hold of the guy. Uh, this is, I think, in 1999. Uh, he said, my uh, dot com company uh, just went public and I've got a, a lot of money that I need your help with. Um, it was over $100 million. And they put together a financial plan and decided, the, the client decided he didn't need all of that. Um, so we built the, the investment solution for the amount that he needed for the rest of his uh, his life and gave the rest away. I think it was over $80 million that they gave away. Oh, my goodness. I wow. think at that time that was more than the total AUM of the company. And I, I, I just love that. Like who, who would even think about doing that? Uh, but it was the right thing, uh, was what the client wanted. And they found some really great places to donate, uh, just a ton of money. Well, that's great. Uh, that's really, that's really great. Um, philanthropy is a very American thing and, uh, to be involved in it at that level is a, a very exciting thing. Um, so you mentioned earlier about how last year was a terrible year. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the toughest times in the business. You've been an advisor now, uh, for 16 years. Could you tell us about some of the tougher times and what you did as a, as a leader of a firm to try to make things work in the firm? Um, the first thing that pops into my head is, um, when we were just shutting down for COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. And the market fell, what was that, 33% in 34 days or 34% in 33 days? I can never remember. Um, but as the leader of the firm, we've got, you know, 300 families, client families that we're taking care of, uh, a dozen families on the team with a little bit of overlap because there's some family involved. Um, that, that was pretty stressful, not knowing how far down the market was going to go. Um, and not having any idea what this pandemic thing was uh, back when we didn't know how how deadly it was. Is it going to be, you know, fifteen percent of the people get it die or one and a half percent? So uh, I remember having conversations around. We put in place pretty quickly, um, kind of some thresholds. If our revenue falls to this level, then we'll cut everybody's salary by this. Uh, we'll shave off these expenses. And um, so I'm answering the question a little bit more from taking care of my team, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's what so the, that's, those were. Yes, that's great. Yeah. Those, those were tough conversations. Thankfully the market rebounded pretty quickly and uh, we, we didn't have to put uh, into action any of those, but that was, uh, I don't know. I think to answer your question, it was a scary time. Uh, but I was really proud of our team and how we came together and uh, worked through those issues. Um, probably thanks to EOS and uh, Gino's program as well for giving us the framework for that. Nice, and it kept you kept you in line when when others were losing their mind. You you were organized, which is great. Um, you know, all growth companies like yours have some disruptive things that they do that make them appear different and make them appear unique. And I wondered in your firm, what are those unique things? We might have already spoken about them, or maybe there's some new ideas and new thoughts that would come out for, to the four day. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the EOS system helps uh, put us, um, or drove, so the way we've defined that is we give our client the three things that uh, we give clients to make us unique are clarity and confidence. So that's really just the planning focus. Uh, team service, so that we, we've talked about it, but the advisors being on the same page, if the client calls up and the advisor's out of town, uh, we can still take care of them. And the third is truth-based advice. Um, so we'll call that time-tested truths found in the Bible. Uh, minimize the use of debt, diversify, give generously, live contentedly. Um, we, we try to help our clients um, do those well. 
Nice. Nice. And that, that sounds like a great operation and a great way to run a, run a firm. And, and uh, that gives you, you know, the opportunity to grow. And that's really what it's all about. So, Nate, um, we've been through a weird pandemic. We've been through another really bad year in 2022 and some other challenges in the past. So um, as you look forward for the next decade, what do you see happening in our industry? What do you think will happen? Give us your view. Oh, man, that's a great question. Where, where's my crystal ball? Uh, clients keep thinking yeah, I have look. one around here. <laughs> um, I, you know, the, the headlines have been talking a lot about AI. And mm -hmm. I had an uh, interesting conversation with the head of a school a few weeks ago who asked me how I thought AI would impact our industry. And I hadn't really thought about it up to that point. We haven't really implemented any of it, I think. Maybe as client communications might be a way that the AI could help uh, help us do our jobs. But I think for at least the way we do it, to sit across the table from a client or even on a, a computer screen now and engage in that relationship and build that trust, I don't think that's going to change dramatically. I think that's what people want. I think that's what they need. Uh, I think they need... It, it, we need it in other areas, but we have all this information around us. We need someone to provide context for that information. So what, what does it mean that the rates are at the highest rate since they've been since 2007? Well, let's, let's dig into that and figure it out. So to have a relationship built on trust that, um, you know, helps them get, reach their goals. I, I don't know that that changes dramatically. The tools will probably change. Um, you know, I, I tend to believe that the markets are efficient and that how we do the investing really isn't going to change a whole lot. Um, I don't know. Maybe as the world gets more globalized, the, uh, the downturns get uglier. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know. So we'll stick so to what we do now. Uh, and try to minimize worry along the way uh, for our clients and ourselves. Nice. Nice. Well, and, and not non-answer to your question. Yeah, the great, great answer. And then here, here's one final question that I like to ask. So we're, we're, you know, going to be seen by about 300 financial advisors in the near term and probably a thousand over the next year and uh, hopefully more in the future, uh, this interview. So, um, consider yourself in an auditorium and all those people are there and, uh, and you have the opportunity to send a message to all of them today. What might that message be? Uh, I'm glad you asked that. And um, the, what, what has been so helpful for us and the U.S. got us there, but it was getting really clear on who we are and who we help. And yeah, there's what is it 400,000 financial advisors in the country something like that <clears throat> that's a lot of diversity and a lot of clients don't think the way that we think so figure out who you are get really true to that and be be your authentic self and you will find clients that are drawn to that and that's that's winning so us as advisors when we're serving clients in a way that they want to be served and that really rings true to their spirit, that, that, that's the win-win. I think that's what we're looking for. So for 300 uh, advisors or whatever it is, if you haven't figured out what your core values are, uh, get the book traction or find some other way to, to boil that down, figure out who those are. And um, what we've found is we got really clear on those values. There were people on the team that weren't a good fit. And actually, they, they self-selected out. They went to find other places that were a better fit for them. Um, so nice. it's, it's played out really well for us. Find your niche and play it well. Yeah. Nice. Well, this is great, Nate. Thank you so much for being with us today. I think we're, I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, and, and we appreciate your being with us today on Financial Advisors Workshop. Thank you, Brian. I really, really enjoyed it and really enjoyed the opportunity to unpack some of these things with you. Great stuff. And I uh, hope we all learn from each other and 
And thanks all, all our listeners to being part of this as well today. And, and uh, like I said, we'll leave it there. We will be back again with another great interview with someone just like Nate. Give us some really interesting ways and in how to be a great financial advisor in America today. So thanks, everybody. Uh, over and out for the Financial Advisors Workshop. Thanks so much.